<laughs> now, with no further ado, let's uh, come to our first uh, dialogue and discussion part with an opening conversation between Jan Tallinn and Ulrike Franke. I see her already over there. And uh, Rike, as you call yourself, Rike, it's wonderful to have you. Let me shortly introduce you to our crowd. You will lead us through the next 45 minutes. You are a policy fellow of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Your focus is on security and technology. Your credentials are outstanding as far as these topics are concerned. You hold a master degree from Sciences Po, have been a research assistant at the IISS, and whoever has, knows what that acronym know, uh, it means, it is the leading strategic institute worldwide. And you are a pol policy affiliate at the governance of AI project at Oxford University. So I think you are very, very well versed to engage, to engage Jan Tallinn about his role as co-founder of Skype and Kazaa, as well as the objective of the Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Rike, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, I hope everyone can, can hear me well and see uh, and hear Jan well as well. Um, a wonderful good afternoon to all of you and, and welcome to this opening discussion of the Aspen Berlin AI Week 2020. I'm very glad that you could all join us and listen to us. Um, and I'm happy and indeed honored to have been asked to, to lead this discussion with Jan Tallinn um, over the next 45 minutes minutes or so. Jan, as it was already mentioned, um, is of course a, a physicist by training, a computer programmer. He was a leading developer of, of Kazaa and Skype, it has been said. But more recently, and maybe more immediately relevant for our discussion today, Jan has made an, a name for himself as one of the leading thinkers on AI and one very important investor in various AI research, and most notably research on AI as a potential existential risk. Um, he has supported a variety of research organizations, such as the Center for the Study of Existential Risk in Cambridge, or indeed um, he's donated to the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford, to which I also remain affiliated. Now, Jan, we only have 40 minutes or so, so I want to dive right in. And there are broadly two topics I would love to discuss um, with you now. And the first is indeed this idea of artificial intelligence as existential risk. So we're talking about the long-term, the potential long-term impact of AI. And I think, by the way, that is brilliant that this AI week starts with, with, with this long-term view. And the second topic I would love to touch upon as well is a bit more short-term focused, if you like. Um, namely, I'd love to talk a little bit about policy implications um, or indeed your advice to policymakers, if you have any, and your view of, of international cooperation and competition um, on AI. But, but let's start with this existential um, risk uh, idea. Now, you started out as someone who was working on something very practical, right? A business venture, um, you developed something that, that people could use. So, so absolutely not long-term, but, but very short-term and, and business focus, if you like. So I would love to start kind of at the beginning of your own journey and ask you how and why, and if you like, when, did you become interested in these long-term implications of artificial intelligence? What prompted your thinking of artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence, as an ex existential risk? Good afternoon. So, uh, yeah, I think it started like now well over a decade ago in 2007, 2008, uh, when I was already kind of scaling out uh, from my role in Skype. And uh, I remember a friend of me asking that, uh, so Jan, how does it feel to have your life's work done at such an early age? <laughs> to which I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I should like look <laughs> out like if there's anything more important than Skype out there. And indeed, like uh, I stumbled upon uh, writings of uh, a young man in California. His name is Eliezer Yudkowski. At least he was a young man back in 2006, seven. Uh, and he was making this like implausible case that, uh, look, uh, 
the invention of uh, human level AI might be the most important uh, thing. And it's also that humanity has done or, or will do. And it also probably the most risky thing that humanity will do, which is kind of unlikely to end well for us unless we do something about it. And uh, I you know, was very impressed with his uh, essays. He has written like over a thousand essays about this and related topics. Uh, so I shot him an email and we met in some bleak California highway uh, cafe uh, for four hours. And after that, I was like very convinced, OK, this seems to be the most underappreciated topic in the world. And I you know, immediately sprung to action and started to uh, see like, what can I what can I do about it? So now I've been working on this for over a decade. And, and when you say human level AI, so just to, to make sure that, that we all get this right. So this existential risk, and I want to talk about what this means more in a second, but this existential risk stems from what you just called human level AI, which has also been described as AGI, artificial general, general intelligence. So, so we are talking about a future technology which does not exist yet. Is that right? Exactly. I do think that's, a, that's an important confusion uh, that uh, is kind of uh, interfering many, many uh, discussions and making them unproductive is that people have like very different things in mind when they, when they say AI or, or even AGI or, or uh, so it's, uh, I think it's important to kind of delineate uh, kind of AI that we already have. And now we have questions about how it is going to be uh, deployed. For example, like face recognition or like deep fakes are, are, are concerned now, self-driving cars, etc. I mean, they, they already exist uh, to like uh, perhaps to some uh, module or some like small parameter like error rate or something like that. Uh, and then AI that just does not exist yet, but we might have to prepare uh, uh, for its uh, introduction. So uh, myself, I've been like, really focused on the on the things that don't exist yet. Uh, therefore, like every once in a while, I get kind of accusations about like uh, of, uh, engaging in science fiction and, and whatnot. But like, I mean, science fiction, many of the things that that uh, uh, exist firmly exist today. I mean, this thing, right, was like firmly firmly science fiction, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, I don't know, <laughs> 40, 40 years ago. Right? No, absolutely. And I mean, first of all, I think as, as many other people who work on new technologies, I'm a big science fiction fan, so I don't think that there's anything wrong with thinking in terms of science fiction. But also, um, the, the question really is, is, is it science fiction that we're talking about, or is it just a future development? And um, since you mentioned uh, criticism, I'm sure you've, you've heard the criticism that worrying about kind of AI taking over, AI killing everybody, um, however you want to you frame it, um, is a bit like worrying about overpopulation on Mars, right? Something that's so far out that we really shouldn't shouldn't um, care about it. But I guess um, I, I would love to hear from you why I assume you think that it is worth thinking about this even today. So, so you just said that in your discussions, um, you came to the conclusion that the development of AGI, at least unless it is framed in a certain way and maybe controlled in a certain way is un uh, unlikely to end well for humanity or humankind. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? What exactly is the risk um, when we develop artificial general intelligence, super intelligence? Isn't that the solution to all of our problems? What's the existential? And you say existential and not just risk. You say existential in terms of this could end humankind. What is the existential risk that, that you are uh, concerned with? Indeed. Like, first of all, about this uh, famous Andrew Ng uh, 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 soundbite about overpopulation. I think Stuart Russell, who is kind of leading figure uh, about the AI safety in the academia and author of uh, the most uh, famous AI textbook, uh, he has like a brilliant answer that's like, overpopulation on Mars, we shouldn't worry about it. Well, what if humanity was spending like billions, if not tens of billions or hundreds of billions per year uh, on, on figuring out how to, how to populate Mars? Uh, and we don't know how quickly things will unfold once the population starts. Like, wouldn't it be like sensible at least to spend like a few tens of millions thinking about what are the consequences of of such uh, um, action, like course of action? Uh, so yeah, I think like the overpopulation uh, thing is just silly. Uh, now, I think in general, uh, like one way of looking at uh, at AI. Uh, is and indeed it's kind of I think it's productive too. Whenever you see a text of it that uh, mentions AI, 
as I as I said earlier, it it kind of means different things to different people. It's just like play the world, play the game uh, that's uh, called taboo the world in rationality community that I'm part of, which is that uh, you just completely replace the world with something else. And I, I suggest you should replace it with delegating human decisions to machines. And a lot of the things become much clearer, like what are the dangers, uh, what are the opportunities, etc. So like one central thing is that uh, uh, you can look at like the decisions that humanity is making like every every day uh, and uh, and see like uh, what are the what, like all the decisions that are made like what what is, what is the fraction of humanity's decisions of all the decisions that are happening on this planet like clearly humans are no longer making decisions about like high high frequency trading uh, trading actions uh, this is like all, almost all entirely delegated now to machines and uh, we are in in like like the fraction of human decisions in the mix that are made on this planet is, is decreasing. Uh, and the problem with delegation, as uh, many of us know, if not all of us know, is that whenever you delegate something, you hopefully gain something in terms of um, capabilities or ability to, to uh, kind of get what you want or, or productivity, etc. But you're also yielding, out, yielding some control. So you have less control over the outcomes that you had, had before. So the concern really is that uh, as we are either from kind of, uh, how should I put it, out of naivety or like uh, out of silliness or out of like just real economic and game theoretic pressures, uh, delegating things away in a way that uh, uh, might rob us control over what's happening on this planet. Like one likely outcome of that is that we are going to lose control over the environment. I mean, we already have, or they are kind of losing control in terms of, one way of framing global warming is that these human collective decisions, um, kind of, or like humans making individual decisions that uh, uh, aggregate into something that is bad for environment. Once we have delegated away most of human decisions, what happens to environment is no longer under human control. And we really, need the particular environment that we are part of remain in very narrow uh, parameter range. Like if temperature just re rises like 10 or, or, or 50 degrees, which is nothing uh, for AI, for robots. I mean, the reason we send, send AI and robots uh, out of space is that they do not care about the environment. Like we're gonna, gonna go come, like extinct in a matter of minutes. So, so it's really crucial for us to gonna retain control and not delegate away things that, that we need for our survival. Although, so you mentioned a very important word here, which is control. Do you really think that if an, an, an artificial general intelligence, this, this kind of, at this point, almost mystical machine that is able to um, do not just one task, but pretty much learn any kind of tasks that humans are able to do um, and, and, and do so better, if this machine was, was to appear, do you really think that humankind would be able to control such a machine and should that be the the goal or is it more that we need to make sure now that we develop in a way that the goals of this machine are aligned with human goals so yeah so there yeah, are multiple you elaborate on this kind of control versus alignment point indeed there are multiple approaches uh to uh you know, for ensuring that outcomes are good i once like again a decade ago or so i had like heated argument with one like artificial general intelligence developer uh or researcher who said like yeah like, your worries are completely pointless once we have superhuman ai like uh, what's going to happen is as like like we will not understand just what, what's going to happen next because uh just rabbits are not going to be able to understand what's what's happening right now on the planet. And I was like, wait a minute, why are you working on a project that has a random outcome from humanity's perspective? What, shouldn't you shouldn't it be kind of uh, uh, make, trying to make a good future rather than a random future? Uh, and that kind of took him aback a little. But yeah, that there are a sort of a, a few uh, you know strategies uh, when it comes to kind of ensuring that the future is good rather than random, uh, rather than something that we, we are not able to survive. Uh, one is uh, just kind of trying to limit uh, the capacity uh, that AI AI has. So kind of keep them domain specific, for example. Uh, so it's it's uh, but it's like of course this is it's kind of uh, 
Although it's debatable, like I'm right now in, in, a, in a debate with, with some people who are going to argue that it's actually, it seems that domain is promising to keep AI domain specific because right now domain specific AIs are more capable than general, general, uh, more general AIs. And hopefully this trend will continue. So like that's one strategy, just like keep, uh, keep the capabilities in some kind of niche and humans, so the only kind of general uh, agents on this planet who can have a big picture of what's going on and thereby kind of like steer the future. The other way is, is to indeed uh, have some kind of like docile AI, AI that is uh, able to uh, sort of uh, keep back the control. Once, once we delegate decisions and, and AI is kind of confused, like sees that there's like this um, concept of robustness to distribution shift. Like ideally you want your AIs, if they, if they uh, see like completely uh, unforeseen situation to kind of uh, yield back to back to human control rather than just like plow ahead. Although like we've had like many, many situations where that strategy actually doesn't work either. Like humans are kind of uh, unable to take back the control when it's kind of a very critical moment. Uh, and third, third strategy indeed is um, like building AI in a way that as it gets more capable, it will also become more aligned in a sense that like, mm -hmm. as it, like as it gets more capable in terms of steering the future, it will also have like more interest and more uh, understanding about what the good future according to human values are, or like some, perhaps even some like generic values that humans are just part of, uh, that human values are just instance, instance of. Uh, so like it, there is like some hope uh, there are some philosophical arguments that like this might actually happen automatically. Uh, that, but I, myself, I would just give like a couple of percent probability to that. Like there, there are some arguments, some very interesting arguments that uh, once you have smarter and smarter agents, uh, they might, for game theoretic reasons, uh, to become in some sense uh, more benevolent. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I'm not gonna like there is like. But yeah, I, I don't think that's this is something we should kind of rely on. But but there indeed there are very interesting philosophical arguments like why uh, why the default outcome actually might be good. That that seems to be quite a gamble. I mean, I think you, you outlined oh, yeah. really, really nicely kind of different ways of yeah, either control or alignment. So so keeping AI domain specific, to which I would uh, kind of say that sounds theoretically like maybe an answer, but given that there are many actors around the world mm -hmm. who openly or not so openly are indeed trying to build AGI. Um, that seems like a dangerous strategy, but 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 could work. The checking back AI, that that seems like a, like a good idea, have an AI that is very capable, but but before, I don't know, doing something um, uh, that has big implications for, for human life is checking back to to humans, that 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 may be a good um, uh, idea, or indeed this alignment, um, which I would say is basically what those who work on AI safety are trying to, to ensure, right? I mean, those who work like on AI, AI safety today. The, the yeah. AI safety community whose work you can, everybody can look at, uh, at the place called Alignment Forum, alignmentforum.org. Uh, it's kind of like approaching like many, uh, many research uh, avenues, like including all these, all the aforementioned strategies, plus all like uh, sort of, uh, just kind of investigative things like doing surveys and and whatnot. I think there's a lot of very interesting thing, very interesting research going on uh, about like just. I think a couple of weeks ago I read like super interesting uh, research result from Miri uh, Miri Miri researcher Machine Intelligence Research Institute, the institute uh, that was co-founded by Eliezer uh, Eliezer Witkowski, who who kind of brought me into this topic. Uh, there was a like, very interesting. Uh, Kind of theoretical conceptual advance like what it means uh, to have you know, agency uh, and uh, sort of like, like that's this is probably like too deep time but like uh, but but there is like a fundamental confusion AI AI community uh, so far has made a very clearly wrong uh, assumption uh, when like humans are building AIs they, they are make, making like very clear distinction is kind of like uh, almost Cartesian dualist uh, assumption that AI, like dividing their systems into uh, an agent and an environment. Mm -hmm. So like the AI is uh, kind of a machine that is then acting in environment, but the AI does not consider itself a part of the environment. Uh, but this is clearly wrong. 
like and and uh, uh, so like but like we don't have like good uh in general, the world doesn't have a like, good way of thinking about what it means to have like embedded agents, agents mm-hmm. who are actually also part of the environment themselves. Uh, and like it seems like just for me, I say to the research community, just one 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 result, example result, uh, recent result was was like what to me looked like a significant advance in this like very, uh, I would like, say not just AI speci- AI safety specific, but kind of general, uh, even general philosophical progress. So it's an interesting, very interesting area. It, it absolutely is. And I think you raise a really important point here, which is on all of this, we basically need to think about a technology that does not exist yet. And I've just been wondering, I mean, since you've been doing this for quite a long time, um, whether, how do you approach this? Do you have any any tips on how to how to think about it? And maybe related to that, um, depending on, on where you go with this. But I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, or ask you about kind of policy work, mm-hmm. how can those in the policy um, decision-making positions today kind of take into account what you have been saying? Because, of course, policy work is somewhat more short-term, and, and um, I know that you've, you've advised the European Union, you've been part of the higher-level um, expert group on, on artificial intelligence, but how can the more policy um, people kind of think about this technology which doesn't exist yet and take into account um, uh, what kind of future this may entail. Yeah, I do think that it's um, uh, it's kind of like hard to give like very concrete policy uh, mm-hmm. suggestions yet. Uh, I would kind of defer mostly uh, to people in Oxford called uh, Governance of AI, GovAI, uh, at, the, at the FHI, Future Humanity Institute. I do think that they are doing great work. Um, like, sort of my abstract answer would be that uh, uh, you should kind of think hard about like incentives uh, that you are uh, incentive landscape uh, that mm-hmm. you are kind of creating or maintaining. Uh, for example, I do think that the biggest sort of uh, like AI risk deniers, uh, or or uh, if I should kind of use that term, are associated with corporate centers. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and I, it's not really surprising because, like, people there do have like a very real conflict uh, between uh, between uh, kind of increasing the profits of their company, which, by the way, they are legally obliged to. Like, they're, they're, at least in the US, you, you do have like uh, laws that uh, if you are like on the board of company, uh, then you should kind of uh, always be maximizing profits for your shareholders. Uh, and uh, on the other hand. Uh, they uh, like they are human as well. So like it's 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 uh, like, you know, my hope is that that uh, they wouldn't do uh, things that are just profit maximizing. But like that's kind of that is like one thing that regulators have. Like so so uh, like, like if you're gonna push for companies at kind of at uh, uh, what's the word? At the threat of like legal action from shareholders mm-hmm. and whatnot to only follow profit motives, like this is what you're gonna get. Like you're gonna get like disenfranchised, hum- disenfranchised humans, etc. Now humans that are pushed away from uh, from economy once they become kind of uh, marginally less profitable than machines, etc. So like, this is like one kind of like general thing. The other thing uh, that I think regulators should kind of uh, think about is that what what things you should kind of get ready to regulate. Uh, and like one concrete thing that I've been saying a few times is you should kind of start thinking about how to regulate compute. Uh, because like there is, uh, uh, there are kind of two possible uh, and not non-exclusive you know, barriers that still kind of uh, separate you know, the current situation and situation where humans are no longer controlled. On this planet, like one is there might be kind of software breakthrough. Uh, people, you know, just like there was a breakthrough with with deep learning uh, in like early two thousands, uh, or there might be a you know, hardware uh, increase. Uh, so it's possible that uh, that uh, uh, we already have the software. It's just we just need more hardware, and then like we're done. Like humans are already basically uh, a second um, second level species here. Uh, so, like, uh, it's possible that we might have like more control. Might want a species have more control about what, how big the the uh, data centers, compute centers, will be. 
Although, so on this on this specific point of regulating compute, so so to give a little bit of of, of context um, uh, for those listening, so what is often said is that AI basically has three main inputs, key inputs, um, talent, data, and compute, so computing power. And you just said that um, one good idea may be to, to regulate and I guess limit um, the amount of compute that one can have in, in one specific space. But, but wouldn't that only slow down things, but not necessarily change things in the long run? Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, I, I, I want to stress again. Like, I'm not saying that we should start regulating uh, compute now. Mm -hmm. We should be kind of thinking ahead. Like, at what would, what kind of preparations can we do when it turns out that next year or next decade we really, 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 really make sure have to make sure that that uh, uh, compute that we throw at, at uh, machine learning is limited. Uh, so, so it's just like a w one thing in arsenal. Uh, of regulatory arsenal that we that we might want to prepare, and it would might take like many years to prepare for for something having a capability like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like I like this idea of kind of having different tools in the arsenal, and I guess this is always yeah. a good advice for policymakers: think of different scenarios, and then think of different things that you could mm -hmm. do if these scenarios um, arise. And and I guess yeah, at, at the EU level, there's still there's still a lot of work to be done um, there. Um, also, I, I, want, I want, want want to say that like uh, what. What very often happens is, is that, uh, that you will get kind of the discussion about this will get derailed uh, by somebody saying like, wait a minute, this is like overpopulation on Mars. So wait a minute, we, have, we don't even have robots that can stand up. Well, we do mm -hmm. actually, but, but like uh, a few years ago when that they're thinking of, uh, we didn't have those. So like, like you can always come up with like things that, uh, that AI can't do today and then use that to justify inaction. Uh, but I think that's, this is just like wrong. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that 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 point is is very well taken. Um, I'm already getting lots of questions from the audience. I'm going to see whether I can group them in a way that that kind of makes sense. Um, several of them kind of go or touch upon international competition on AI and global security issues. So let's see. Um, for instance, this one, w what are, in your opinion, the implications of AI on global security issues? Are there more benefits or risks? And should there be limitations to the use of AI? And if I may kind of add on, because I think this is where the discussion is going, um, I know that you in the past have been critical of using AI in the military realm. Um, I'd be really interested in, in hearing more about this, given that, of course, AI is increasingly used in the military realm in a variety of ways um, from combat to non-combat functions. But, but um, yeah, so your view on the kind of more security-focused implications of AI, I think, is what we're asking. Yeah, I, I, I do think that there are kind of two major reasons to be like super careful about uh, introducing AI into military. Uh, and those two reasons people necessarily don't think about, like there's a lot of discussion about like, will the kind of battlefield with AI be kind of more humane, which it well might be. Uh, I'm not like arguing with those, those people at all. Uh, I do think there are two reasons why, why it's very dangerous uh, to have like an kind of unmitigated uh, arms race. So one is that uh, whenever you are in a military competition uh, like that is centered around AI, like humanities, like our species ability to control the trajectory kind of uh, suddenly drops a lot uh, because suddenly you have like this, these incentives to be secretive uh, about things and to, to not cooperate as long as you don't trust the other. The reason why people are engaged in arms races is that other people are engaged in arms races. Like whenever you start, in, like, start an arms race, uh, which means it means that like what, what's going to happen is no longer under your under your direct control. It's like game theory that that's going to make your decisions for you from now on. So that's like one very big reason. Uh, like once we kind of uh, start like our arms race in AI, uh, like humans kind of no longer dictate their future. Uh, second uh, reason is that uh, like kind of more practical reason is that uh, currently there is a difference between state actors and non-state actors uh, in terms of military capacity. And the reason is that the state actors have much more humans uh, than, than non-state actors. Uh, once you take humans out of the loop, like you're going to remove the principled reason why non-state actors 
are less powerful militarily uh, than state actors. Anybody with money will have kind of state-of-the-art ability to kill people. And I don't think that world is going to be safe. You're muted. <laughs> yes, of course, this had to happen. Um, and that is, that is an extremely interesting uh, point, because on the one hand, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and you're right in, in saying that, well, giving non-state actors that kind of power is really dangerous. On the other hand, um, it also means that weaker actors are gaining in power, which may not always necessarily be negative, right? So there's a certain kind of David versus Goliath um, um, d- development I, 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 here. I, I've heard like uh, <laughs> I, I visited like a military contractor in Estonia had like exactly the same. I'm same not surprised. Argument. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And 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 this is and and I guess this is how uh, that this way you just answered the the question where, very well because it it basically shows that. Um, if we go away from the kind of normative question of whether this is good or bad, and I guess one can make the argument for for both sides, at least theoretically, what you just said at least shows very well how AI can influence the global balance of power. And that, at the very least, is, well, destabilizing, and destabilizing is generally not great. Yeah, I mean, what what we already see is that in in cyberspace, uh, in kind of uh, cyber terrorism, etc., like there's like a massive mix. I think the state actors are in minority there, even though they are very powerful there, clearly. Like they are in minority. Like most of the action, most of the damage is done by non-state actors there. Um, I was just, well, because you just said non-state actors in cyberspace, because there was a role, there was a question about the role and risk of hackers in the launch of AGI. So so I guess, okay. So I guess the, what what the person asking this question here is, um, asking if AGI was to emerge, do you think it would be developed by, I don't know, DeepMind, OpenAI, um, DARPA, so the, the kind of state-funded, mm-hmm. military-funded um, defense agency in the US, or indeed could it in the end emerge from more, I don't know, secretive individuals, I mean, maybe not individuals, but smaller, smaller groups, the kind of hackers that this person here asks about. Is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's a possibility. Like one important thing uh, to, uh, that, that once, uh, once you're going to no longer talk about AI that already exist, exists, uh, then you, like, uh, you no longer have like, guarantees about what's going, to, what's going to happen. That said, I do think that uh, currently, we are not seeing diminishing returns uh, to adding hardware. Uh, therefore, uh, right now, uh, I think the most likely places uh, to uh, yeah, that work right now, I don't think like hackers in cellar uh, are very likely uh, players uh, because like they don't have as much access to hardware. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like that trend might kind of peter off at some point uh, when we when we kind of have to go back to kind of software innovation again. Um, I don't know. I think we should be prepared for both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I would also think not not enough access to hardware, maybe not enough access to data. But but yeah, as you say, depending on. I think on data is overrated. Um, like, oh, interesting. Why? Yeah. why? Uh, because, like, I mean, people already are talking more and more about synthetic data. Like the the, the thing that I that I say is, is that uh, look. The most powerful games player on the planet is Alpha Zero. What does zero mean there? Zero data. So it's like you always can, data is just like something, it's like a crutch that can help you uh, to uh, get to things faster. But once you have a sufficiently powerful system, like, in fact, that the, the main thing, again, Stuart Russell has a great quote, like, like we don't teach human kids uh, what the giraffe is by showing them 10 million pictures of giraffe. This is like a very temporary, Problem with current generation of AI that it that it needs a lot of data. I'm pretty sure this this uh, kind of uh, thing will be fixed. Mm-hmm. So, so synthetic data, but also data efficiency, I guess, right? Like not yeah, not yeah, needing yeah. as yeah, much it's like, uh, data. The, the, the way you usually do is like you take some data to get things kind of uh, going, and then you're gonna have, uh, most of the data will be actually synthesized based on based on the th- like few things that you have. Mm-hmm. Just like humans do it, right? Exactly. No, I think this is a really important point because we keep hearing these things, you know, data being the new oil or China being really um, yeah, Again, this is from people who think that. about uh, AI that existed two years ago. 
Yeah, yeah. So fast, fast development. And um, I have a question in the chat, which I think is great because I also wanted to go in, in that direction before we end, which is, I'm going to read it out. There was a lot of discussion about bias embedded in AI. This has clear implication um, for global security. How can we become more aware of, aware of these biases and can they be mitigated? And I guess, I mean, just this week, actually, there was a big controversy about a, a researcher at Google being mm -hmm. let go, allegedly over or reportedly over criticism of, of bias in, 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 in Google's AI. Um, and I know that that you not too recent and uh, not too, too long ago also invested indeed in um, or donated to research institutions that look at these more kind of immediate negative side effects of AI. So, so yeah, so how, how can we become more aware of these biases? Can they be mitigated? What should be done? Yeah, so like my kind of uh, high level answer to that is that like, I think this is really important where the kind of division of labor uh, comes into play. There are a lot of people who are already looking at the implications uh, and deployment of existing AI. And I think like bias, widening bias is, is very high on, on their list. Like uh, uh, Brian Christian just uh, released a great book uh, the alignment problem, I think, uh, that uh, that like describes like very interesting uh, you know history of all the current problems that we have AI and, and looking ahead also a little bit. And so I highly recommend that book. Uh, like like myself, uh, because I'm focused on on AIs that don't exist yet, uh, I mostly think through like what are the implications of uh, near term work uh, to long-term outcomes. And uh, I do think that kind of bias, it's not obvious how, how kind of debiasing helps the long-term outcomes uh, one way or the other. I think it's like, like, uh, like when I look at the you know, currently hot topics uh, in you know, AI or FATML, fair and transparent uh, AI, I think the most potent uh, research areas that are kind of useful for both in, the, in both short term, but also in long term, are things like transparency, accountability, uh, explainability. Um, there are like many arguments uh, why we would be on a safer, much safer trajectory if we actually knew what's happening on those in those servers when we train them. Uh, do, do you think? Do you think that we're likely to achieve transparency and accountability and explainability? Because this is something, so as someone who isn't a tech expert and looks at this from the outside, um, the one thing I, I, I very much struggle with is this idea of, of AI, and especially kind of machine learning um, systems as black boxes, where it may never be able to really understand how a machine learning system mm -hmm. um, arrived at its conclusion. Do you, as a tech expert, see a a um, development where we may be able to solve that um, problem? Because as you say, yeah. that may indeed help quite a bit. I, I do think that there are like many ho hopeful things. That, by the way, this is something that regulators can push for. Mm. Like, uh, like uh, just not approving medical systems that, that say like, well, looks like 99% you need an operation. <laughs> like, what and why? Like, I don't know. It's just like suggested. <laughs> like, so it's like, it's probably not like very reasonable uh, to have like approved such kind of technology, uh, which also means that like, uh, even without regulators help, I think there is some commercial pressure. Uh, like once you have like, uh, like medical AI that can actually kind of explain itself uh, and, and be kind of transparent about its reasoning, uh, then, uh, then that that will be much more kind of commercially successful. Like uh, given like, given other things would be equal. Uh, but uh, so th there are some commercial uh, incentives uh, to to increase or put research and effort into explainability and transparency. So that that's like one obvious thing that makes me optimistic. There are some some areas that there are much less commercial um, commercial pressure. So like uh, the I I think we kind of uh, need to fund more researchers to do the homework of AI, AI researchers in that, spec, that, res, that respect. But I, I do think that, uh, yeah, transparency, explainability are things that are both useful in short term for safety and capabilities, but also good for, for long term. But, uh, but again, I, I don't want to like, uh, I want to go back to kind of, uh, this like, division of labor thing. I, I'm super glad that there are people who are working on, uh, on like various clearly important things like, uh, yeah, bias, avoiding bias. And like, I mean, global warming, <laughs> that's another thing. Like one thing that global warming uh, assumes is that humans will remain in charge on this planet, uh, which I don't believe, but 
uh, still that doesn't mean that I'm kind of like uh, sort of want to diminish the efforts of, of people who are actually kind of addressing this problem because I might be wrong. It, it might it might might be the case that that we still have several years left, several hundred years left. Certainly, yeah, and, and and this is a bit the difference between you know catastrophic risk and existential risk, right? I mean, it's it's definitely worth working on existential risk. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that we should be overlooking uh, catastrophic um, risk. I think we, we're coming very quickly uh, to an end. I think I have about a minute left. However, mm-hmm. um, so I had a few questions about China. Um, mm-hmm. I guess I guess this is a broader question about different players and maybe we can open open it up a little bit to you know the US Europe and China um how, how do you to the extent that you you look at this where the different players stands how mm-hmm. how do, would you currently i don't know rank or assess um the different players when it comes to both ai and the current situation but also future future developments do you think that that between the US Europe and and uh, China one player is clearly leading one is Ascending, mm-hmm. um, one is left behind. <laughs> so, like, I mean, in terms of uh, kind of my own assessment, I do think that UK, uh, mostly because of Deep, deep Mind and US, have the most uh, capable research. But like, I'm also aware that my view is like super biased because <laughs> these are the these are the places and people that I know most. I mean, I've been going to China, Japan, Singapore, etc. Every once in a while. Uh, and I, I'm kind of glad to kind of sit literally between East and West. Like this place here is like kind of equidistant from Beijing and, and Washington. Uh, so, uh, so, so I'm like, I definitely want to have, see like more uh, cooperation because like this is going to be species wide problem. It's just like, uh, I mean, one nice thing about 2020 uh, is that like now people know what it means to have species wide problem. And uh, like, uh, I hope this would be kind of useful like uh, when we will have next species wide problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Rieke, and thank you so much, Jan. This was an enlightening and very interesting conversation and discussion, and I think you helped all of our audience to understand a a little bit better the complexity of the issue, and also by looking very much forward into the future.